Good afternoon, and welcome to the third in our exciting lineup of QI Connects WebEx sessions for 2017, and this is the 33rd session since we began. Um, the, the observant of you will notice that Brian Robson's voice has changed somewhat. Um, uh, I'm Simon Watson, and I'm the Chief Quality Officer and Director of Quality at NHS Lothian, and Brian has been allowed his first holiday in a few years by, by his, and he's away in New Zealand, so I'm uh, delighted to be his locum for this afternoon. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care industries, universities, the third sector and beyond, to learn from international leaders in the field of improvement, innovation, and integration. And we've designed these sessions to be short, accessible, and uh, recorded to allow access to the time that suits people. So we need to understand the technology we're using, and I'd now like to introduce Jennifer Graham uh, from Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who's our colleague here, to take us through how we use WebEx. Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Simon, and welcome everyone to today's session. Um, so I just have a couple of quick housekeeping slides to get started. Um, if you could please use the chat function that you see on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate, and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. Um, and just to flag, if you are having any technical difficulties today, such as not being able to hear the presenter speak, or if you keep losing connection, then please message the event manager using the chat function or by pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. So these sessions are designed to be a fun, interactive learning experience. So we do encourage you to use the chat function to share any questions, comments, or ideas throughout the talk. Um, there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session also. Um, and just also flag, we will be sharing hyperlinks using the chat function to any resources mentioned by our speaker today, and we'll be sharing that along with a copy of the presentation and recording after the session. So we did promise a fun, interactive um, experience, <laughs> so we're keen to find out where you are joining us from today. So if you can just um, click on the, if I did, um, annotation, so the um, icon which looks like a pen just at the top left-hand side of your screen there, and then click on the arrow and then just click on the map to show where you're joining from. Welcome everyone, welcome to mm -hmm. Gisela joining us from Canada. Lots of QI connectors across Scotland, the UK, fantastic. So I'm now going to just hand back over to Simon, who's going to just tell us a bit more about QI Connect and some of the organisations who are joining us for today's session. That's great. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, the, the reach of QI Connect is fantastic, and I'm delighted to say that we now have 546 organisations participating in QI Connect, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But before we get into those, uh, that, that are discussing those organisations, the fun doesn't end just yet. Let's have a small competition, and the competition is... I'm waiting for a slide to come up, is to find the flag. So please get ready to look at the, um, the, all the flags that are coming up and click on the flag for a particular country, and the first person to click on it will win a very special prize. Okay, so drum roll. The country we're looking for is Iceland, the North Atlantic, the country of Iceland. So. Do we have a winner, Michelle? Ian Keith. Ian Keith, my goodness, right. Ian Keith, congratulations, Ian Keith. A, a fabulous prize will be winging its way to you in Glasgow, so well done for that. And the, sorry? <laughs> okay. So um, we initially started off with only one slide of organisation. So we have a slide coming up in a second that will start to show you some of the uh, organisations who are linked into QI Connect. And initially, this only was uh, on one slide, but as you'll see as we scroll through, there's far too many for one slide. So let's just have a look at who we've got. I hope you see your organization as it whizzes, as it whizzes past you there. And 
And I'm delighted also to confirm that we got uh, 53 universities also now participating in QR Connect and using as part of their educational programs. And let's um, just, before we finish with our partner organizations, I'm just going to put a special um, mention to some of the new organizations that have joined us. And these are Berkshire Health Care Foundation Trust, Carmarthenshire County uh, Council in Wales, Community Pharmacy in Scotland, the DHR Group in Australia, Ferryburn Dental Care in Scotland, Gilbray Medical Practice, Health and Social Care Partnership of South Lanarkshire, the Ministry of Health in New Zealand, the National Pharmacy Association and Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnerships here in Scotland, Central Manchester Clinical Commissioning Group, the Wales Deanery, Lancashire Care NHS Foundation Trust, and the best place to see the Northern Lights, the University Hospital of North Norway. So given this global reach and the challenges that, uh, bring us in, uh, that it brings in terms of time zones, uh, his record each of these sessions and make them available through our Healthcare Improvement Scotland website. And as you can see here, there's a photograph of some of our colleagues in Kauawatea in New Zealand who are bringing together their staff for a lunchtime session uh, using one of these recordings. So please consider doing that yourself. And uh, remember that we've got a resource website, uh, which has been shown here, which um, shows you all of the previous or many of the previous talks that we've given. So you can use those anytime. We'd really encourage people to do that. Um, the QI Connect series now is, uh, features as part of an, uh, is an approved resource for ISQA's fellowship program, so used uh, in a very high level uh, training program. And we're also, uh, excuse me, delighted to confirm that we have a partnership now with the Health Foundation as part of their Q initiative program. And the Health Foundation, as many will know, is an independent charity committed to bringing about better health and health care for people in the UK. And Q is an initiative connecting people with improvement expertise across the UK, led by the Health Foundation, supported and co-funded by NHS Improvement. And its mission is to foster continuous and sustainable improvement in health and health care. And we're creating uh, opportunities for people to come together as an improvement community through this program that we're involved with, but also Q, sharing ideas, enhancing skills, and collaborating to make health and care better. And many of you will know that uh, there's an opportunity for people in Scotland to join up with the Q initiative, which closes, uh, I think, at the end of this week. So do have a look at that if you're interested. The final slide, which um, I've, I've pushed Brian Robson out of the nest for this month. Um, I'm chairing. There's a photo of me taking down the borders, Simon. Jennifer's here in the room with me, and uh, as is Michelle. And then we're supported very ably by Carmen, and we get lots of support with the Twitter analysis from Alex Sterling from ISD. So thank you to all of those. And um, I'm particularly grateful for Andrew Winter, who's a medical colleague working here in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, who submitted some fantastic and very thought-provoking questions for Emmanuel, and uh, we'll hear those um, at the end of the session. And do please remember to use Twitter as well as the chat function here to share what we're learning, um, draw people's attention to the resources that are here, and use the hashtag that's shown here, and also follow us as his QI Connect through Twitter. Right, and finally, you'll be relieved to hear that my voice will go in a minute, and you're about to hear our superb speaker, Emmanuel Gobilo, who I think is, uh, is, is accurately described as an inspirational international speaker, consultant, and author, who's been described as the first leadership guru of the MySpace generation, one of the freshest voices in leadership today. And Emmanuel has worked with a range of organizations from companies such as AstraZeneca to Zurich Financial Services via Google and the United Nations. And for the last 15 years, his interventions have focused on creating the capability in organizations to deliver results through world-class leadership. He's one of Europe's most sought-after leadership speakers. He's the author of Kogan Page's UK and US bestseller, The Connected Leader, which is a superb book that I'm reading at the moment, Leadership and Follow the Leader, and his books have established him as one of the foremost thinkers in new leadership models, um, particularly in the space of how connectivity um, can be uh, leveraged by organizations. Emmanuel, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And without further ado, over to you for what I'm sure will be a fantastic talk. Well, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. I have to say I was really looking forward to this until you've put a picture of I'm showing the logo of my old University of St. Andrews. So I'm 
I'm kind of now a bit worried that some of my old professors might be on the call and might um, follow up with me afterwards to tell me that what I said wasn't quite right. Um, but I'll try to do my best. It's a pleasure to speak, uh, not so much with you, but at you for the next half an hour or so, and, and I look forward to um, hopefully getting to some interaction and be able to answer some of your questions. Um, and part of what I wanted to, um, to do today was to get into this idea of how do we get a system uh, to work together? How do we get uh, all the parts to work in harmony uh, and deliver an outcome? And the reason um, I put this picture on is because I spend a lot of my time in conferences and listening to interesting speakers talk about collaboration and how do we um, get people to work with each other. And they always start uh, with the same saying, and they always tell you it's an African proverb just because that makes it sound wise. And they tell you, you know, the African proverb says, if you want to go far, go together, and if you want to go fast, go alone. Now, people are always saying, well, this is, this is very wise, um, except that for me, the thing that bothers me is I'm always thinking, well, what happens if you want to go far and fast? Because most of us uh, in our daily lives have to accomplish things uh, quickly uh, and in the right way. So we want to go far and fast, and then you think, well, do we have to do it alone or together? And that, to me, is the dilemma uh, that we face in our working lives, and I, I'm pretty sure you do too. And it's a dilemma which uh, my friend von Strumpenar calls a OO proposition, um, and OO stands for on the one hand, on the other hand, and our life at work is full of those dilemmas where we say, well, on the other hand, uh, we need to collaborate, but on the other hand, we want to go quickly, and if you want to do, go quickly, then you have to do it yourself, and if you want to do it well, you do it yourself, but then on the one hand, we want this, and on the other hand, we want that, and we are full of this idea, and if I think about the world of improvement, which uh, I know many of you work in, then for me, the world of improvement is a world of oo proposition. And what I want to do is share with you some thoughts about why it is that we find this so hard to do in our working life, and hopefully some ideas as to what you might want to do to make it somewhat easier on yourself. And the first thing um, to note is that um, organizations are really um, just a combination of two things. They're a combination of formal organizations, and they look something like this. And, you know, I never tailor that slide. I always change the color to make my clients feel happy, but they're all pretty much the same, a uh, bunch of boxes and a bunch of lines. And if you've had uh, McKinsey, BCG, or one of the big consulting houses, you've got dotted lines as well. Uh, no one quite knows what they do, but you've paid an enormous amount of money uh, to those consultancies so they could give them to you. By the way, as a tip, if you're ever given a dotted line, a dotted line is just a consultant's way of saying you should really talk to each other. Um, and those are really just what I call organizations. They're the formal organization, which are three things. They are roles and rules and economic incentives. And those three variables, roles and rules and economic incentives, are really what holds an organization together. Uh, the role is this is what you do, the rule is this is how you do it, and the economic incentive is you get paid if you do it that way. But actually, that's not just how an organization functions. There is another uh, part to your organization, which I like to call the company, and I like the word company for its Latin root of breaking bread together, uh, company, companion, companionship, all the same sort of root. And it's about a bunch of people uh, trying to make sense of the world with each other. And the idea is that if you want anything done, and you will know that uh, from your working life, you don't just follow the chart, you don't follow the formal organization, but you also rely on a network of people uh, that you know and are going to help you uh, do a number of things with each other. Now, the problem for us, and this is where most of our issues arise is that the company obeys a different set of rules than the organization. So if you remember, the organization was about roles, rules, economic incentives. 
Whereas the company is really about the individual. It's not about the role. It's about you as a person. It's not about the rules. It's about an element of reciprocity. You do this for me. I do this for you. We work uh, that way with each other. And it's not so much about an economic incentive, but it's more about a social and moral obligation. I do it because I feel an obligation towards you. And the problem that we have is that this formal organization and this social company don't tend to work very well with each other. I'm always reminded uh, of my daughter when she was eight saying to me, Papa, that's the only friend she knows, she said, Papa, I want pocket money. And if you are a normal parent, which some of you may well be, you have a choice. You either say yes or you say no. Now, I'm not a normal parent. I'm a, I'm a leadership development professional. So when my daughter comes up to me and says, Papa, I want pocket money, all I can think about is this is a learning opportunity. So I said, Lulu, that's how I call her. I said, Lulu, I'm not just going to give you pocket money. I'm going to try to teach you the value of money through the act of giving you pocket money. And to do that, because I'm a bit of an HR guy, I'm going to put together an incentive scheme. So this is a true story. If you came to my house, uh, on the fridge was a flip chart, because HR professionals, we all have flip charts at home. And on the fridge was a flip chart, and the flip chart said this, for brushing your teeth every day, I will give you 10 pence. For tidying your bedroom every day, I will give you 10 pence. For brushing your hair, she has long hair. For brushing your hair every day, I will give you 10 pence. For, for um, doing your homework, I will give you 40p, because actually uh, in France, education is more important than hygiene, and I was trying to teach her the cultural values then. And, and for not shouting at your brother, which is obviously a stretch target, I will give you a pound. Um, and then we had the incentive scheme, and everything was working well. Um, until payday, payday is on Sunday, and on Saturday we were sitting at home, um, and I said, Lulu, you've done very well this week, but how about you go and tidy your bedroom? So she went upstairs, uh, 15 minutes went by, not a sound in the house. Now, I should have told you I have two children, so um, 15 minutes with no sound means trouble. Uh, so I went upstairs, and I had a look, uh, and Charlotte uh, hadn't tidied the bedroom at all. The bedroom was a mess. And she was lying on a bed, painting her nails with the Barbie varnish. And so I said, Lulu, we had a deal. You were going to go upstairs. You were going to tidy the bedroom. I was going to give you 10 pence. Everything was going to be beautiful. And she looked back at me with the most beautiful eyes in the world. And she said, Papa, I've been thinking. Uh, for 10 pence, it's just not really worth it. Now, the thing is, um, she was right, and that's the point. Uh, of an organization, if you're going to put some rules in place, you have to make the economic incentive commensurate with the perceived amount of effort, and she'd learned that early, and she'd learned that lesson well. But the lesson, uh, the reason why I mentioned this story is not so much for that, it's because of what happened the following weekend, because the following weekend, we were going to go and see Grandma and Grandpa. So I said, Lulu, George, that's my son, uh, Lulu, George, come on down, we're going to see Grandma and Grandpa at which case Charlotte came down uh, at the speed of light. She went straight to the fridge, straight to the flip chart, looked at it about three times, looked back at me and said, Papa, how much are you going to give me for Grandma and Grandpa? Because it's not on the chart. And this is the problem that we have. The problem is the minute you have decided that you work on the side of the organization and that you're going to put some rules on economic incentives in place, you make social and moral obligation disappear. Charlotte had learned that actually the system of accountability meant that if it was on her accountability, she was to do it. If it wasn't, she didn't have to. Um, and we have spent a lot of years ever since trying to fight that battle of trying to re-engineer a sense of the company, a sense of social and moral obligation uh, inside our relationship. And in organization, it is the same issue. It's that fight between the two. So. Uh, the picture you see on the screen is really my way of saying our task, if we are to stop having those ooh-ooh propositions, our task, if we are to achieve the benefit uh, of the organization, which is that it is a system that delivers uh, in a predictable way and in a replicable way, but whilst at the same time giving it the energy necessary for innovation, of which improvement is part, um, we're going to have to reconnect those two elements that make up every 
um, organization. So how do we do that? Well, uh, it is all about relationships. It's about how we're going to work through our relationships with each other. And I know that uh, when we talk in organization about relationship, we have a different view of relationship and a somewhat warped view of relationships. And I know that uh, because of this. Uh, I don't know if you have Starbucks where you live, but I happen to um, be based in London, uh, and I happen to go to Starbucks. And Starbucks have this habit nowadays of asking for your name. I don't know if you've had that experience. Um, it's, you know, I can imagine there was a meeting in the Starbucks headquarters in Seattle where people decided that it would be a good idea to reconnect with their customers, having deeper relationships by knowing their names. And I also know that once that filtered through about three layers of management, it ended up being an incentive scheme with an accountability saying, collect as many names as you can. Now, my issue with that is it's fine until you realize you're called Emmanuel and you live in London. Uh, because there's not that many of us around called Emmanuel in London. So every time I order a coffee, people say, what's your name? And I say, Emmanuel. And they said, is that Manuel? And I say, no, it's Emmanuel. And they say, is that with an I or with an E? And I say, no, it's with an E. And then they say, two L's or one L and so on and so forth. And I wait about 10 minutes for my coffee just because they can't spell my name. So actually, the one on the screen is my cup. I call myself Tom. Uh, when I'm at Starbucks, it saves me a lot of aggro except when I forget. So sometimes I just forget that I told them I was called Tom, which creates a lot of issues in the queue uh, because somebody shouting coffee for Tom and nobody turning around. And eventually I remember. So I say, oh, that's me, at which stage everybody looks around thinking that guy has just remembered his name. That's how much he needs coffee. But you can see how relationships have become really strange. And we even go one further uh, where people like Amazon have this fantastic system that called Customer Relationship Management System that mined the data for things you like. And this is a copy of an email they sent me in 2009, I believe, where they said, Emmanuel, we know you so well. We have such a deep relationship with each other that we can tell you uh, so and recommend for you some books we know you're going to like, and, and I knew they were right uh, that day because actually two of those books they recommended were ones that I'd written myself. Um, so I also know that your business model is broken when you start buying your own books. But this was Amazon's view of, you know, we know you, so we know you're going to like those books. Now, obviously, they're right. Uh, I do like those books. I spend a lot of time writing them. I think they're very good. But my point is that if this was a true relationship, then actually the email should have looked somewhat different. The email that should have come from Amazon said, Emmanuel, we realize you've written a number of books. Uh, we realize that Amazon is stronger with authors. Uh, we are uh, reliant on each other. What can we do to help you? What can you do to help us? And so on and so forth. That would have been a relationship. So I guess what I'm trying to say is let's not – work through relationships in a mechanical way, but let's remember how humanity when it comes to what a relationship might look like. And the way to start uh, is down here uh, at number one is we need to remember that actually no relationship is possible uh, without trust. And, and the way to align those two, this formal and informal organization, is to connect through the informal organization through trust. And Trust is not a uh, – people always think of trust as, as being very rational, that actually we base our trust decisions on, on a deep analysis of, of ex, based on experience of that individual. That's not quite true. Um, trust is actually as emotional as it is rational. And the first thing to remember that I, I – I want to share that with you um, because I think it's, it's probably even more present in your world, is the thing to remember is we are not what we know. Uh, and I think when you work alongside experts, as you all do, there is a tendency to equate your personal value with your personal knowledge and your personal worth with your professional worth. Um, and actually, that only gets you so far. Um, you have a story on a history uh, which matters as much to those relationships and to the establishment of trust as your professional view and, and your professional value. Um, if you're wondering who the man on the slide is, his name is Andrew Ramroop. He's a master tailor on Savile Row, was one of the first black master tailors on Savile Row, um, and um, I've spent a lot of time alongside him. And he, one day he told me, you know, 
if, if you think that all I am is a teller, then I haven't done my job properly because I also happen to be a human being and, and with a specific identity. And I guess the point that he was making is a point uh, which Sebastian here made in his book, which is that our identity lie in the connections that we've made throughout our lives, not just the things that we've been given to play with. And for me, that goes back to this idea of trust that says, so how do you establish trust beyond what you know? And if you have to deal with people who know a lot and you don't know as much, how can they trust you? Um, and, and so on and so forth. And there is one trick um, that I've learned through my practice, and it's a, a, a trick that I, I've put an elephant on the slide because, you know, people always say if there's only one thing you remember. I guess if there's only one thing you remember from, from this webinar, then I hope this is going to be it. The easiest and best way to establish trust with people um, is simply uh, to ask yourself the following question. Um, and the question is, have I made people feel stronger and more capable? Have I made people feel stronger and more capable? If the answer is yes, then I guarantee you um, that you have established trust. We get trust from the people who make us feel stronger and more capable. That's not the same as happy, by the way. Um, you know, my, my boy George, just so we're clear, his name is George, not boy George. Um, I, I'm not that strange. But uh, my boy George wanted to learn to swim. Uh, now, the trouble is he didn't want to get into the water. There's an issue right there. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to have to make sure that the child gets in the water if he wants to learn to swim. Of course, you don't just push the child and laugh uh, as he cries because that would be cruel. So you will make sure that, uh, you know, somebody is in the pool. Maybe you go down in the pool with him. Maybe you hold him. You tell him you're there. You, you, you're holding him while he's trying to make the movement. But I can guarantee you that at no stage is that child happy. Um, but by putting in place the measures to accompany him throughout, you know that your intent is pure, and you know that eventually he will feel stronger and more capable as a result. Um, and so that's the important message, I guess, in the establishment of trust. And, and for those of you in the UK, you know that. Um, I mean, I arrived in the UK in 1985, and when I arrived in the UK, there were trying to recruit teachers, and they had this wonderful advert I remember vividly, um, which said, nobody ever forgets a great teacher. And they've been doing the same ad with different permutation of it throughout the years that I've been here. But the core message of nobody ever forgets a great teacher is true. And the reason why we never forget a great teacher or a great leader or a great boss or somebody who took a chance on us is because those people made us feel strong. They made us feel more capable when we didn't think we could uh, when we didn't think we were quite ready, they pushed us in a direction, they were more demanding of us, but they were always there for us. So uh, I guess the first thing uh, for me is that message of have I made them feel stronger and more capable, which goes to establishing trust. And, and you know, in your uh, profession, there is a lot of it around. I mean, I was looking at some of the um, end of phase report from different trusts, um, and, and you can see some of that um, coming through when people say, okay, I'm going to um, feel value, I've got the ability to speak, I've got the ability uh, to say my piece, uh, the leadership is investing time in me and effort in me uh, to voice my opinion, and that goes to establishing trust, which then enables you to do something with it. Uh, if you are not connected to the energy of the individuals in that social network, there is no way you will be then able to align that energy to the delivery of the formal objective. Now remember on that picture, I'm saying both pictures matter. It's not a case of, you know, the organization is broken and we should only play with networks or networks are great and we should forget about the organization. We need both. So the key once we're established into this social network is how do we align it? And in terms of alignment, I like to talk about purpose. We align the energy of people through the delivery uh, of the organization's objective via purpose. And, and I guess, you know, again, if, if I think about the improvement world where, you know, I've got my accountabilities, I'm working really hard every day, I'm doing my best every day, and you guys come along and tell me I've got to do something else, which I'm not even really accountable for and seems to be another project, then how do you get those people to align to your effort? 
you do it through purpose. Now, this to me uh, is how I'd like you to remember purpose. Uh, I have seen, I have shown this picture, this picture of a panda many times, uh, and, and always the same thing happens, by the way. I mean, I can't hear you, but if you show it to a room full of people, you will hear half of the audience going, aww. Um, and, and it always happens. People, oh, like that, in kind of, oh, this is so cute. Um, and I always point out that this is not cute. This is just plain weird. If you think of a panda, I mean, nature itself has been trying to kill that thing for years. Okay, this thing has no idea. The panda is a carnivore that are halfway through its evolution decided to go vegetarian, only eating bamboo, and its stomach can't cope. I mean, that thing has no right to exist. And the only reason this is still around is because every time somebody sees the picture, they go, oh, and then give you money. Uh, I mean, even the WWF, not the wrestling one, the wildlife one, even the WWF, they don't even explain what they do anymore. They just show you the picture and you give them cash. And that to me is purpose. So when I talk about purpose, I guess the question that I'm asking is, what's your panda? What is it, by the way, this is probably the weirdest question you're ever going to be asked in a work context, but what's your panda? What is it that you're going to say or that you're going to show or that you're going to do which is going to make me want to give you my energy without you having to do much explaining, without you having to go to the ins and outs of you know, benefits and, and, and return on investment and all of that kind of stuff? How do I just get it so that I want to go, oh, here is my energy? Now, the way you do that is actually the same way as Hollywood does it, is you do it through taglines and pictures. Now, this is a, a, a film. I don't know if you've seen that film. I haven't seen that film. Uh, but the film is called Fighting. And the tagline for that film is, some dreams are worth the fight. Some dreams are worth the fight. Now, if you see the poster and if you hear the tagline, I'm sure you can tell me the story of that film. I'm sure you know it, it kind of, I mean, I'm just imagining it, young guy, Midwest, not much money, wants to make it big, wants to be famous, halfway through the film, spots the girl, doesn't kind of get the girl because she's not interested, but he's going to fight some more, he's going to live the American dream, three quarters of the way, and she suddenly spots him and thinks, actually, he's not that much of a jerk, because in the meantime, she's gone out with some other guy, and then he eventually gets the guy. It's kind of rocky with a better looking guy. I mean, that's kind of what I think that film is about. It's not the same as this one, fired up, two guys, 300 girls, you do the math. Now, completely different film. But I tell you, when you see that poster, you kind of know this is not a first date movie. You're thinking, okay, this is a, um, uh, you know, getting on DVD or Netflix or whatever, a few beers, pizza. This is not the same the kind of film you go and say, hey, that would be a good idea. And I, I tell you what, I've got one specially for you uh, because I knew we were dealing with health. Uh, he was dead, but he got better. Now, that's the ultimate, uh, I guess, healthcare improvement film. Um, and this one is not really fair because it's a Jason Stratham film, so they're all the same. But the point I'm trying to make is what Hollywood doesn't do is it doesn't send you a slide pack with 300 bullet points in order to get you to want to make the decision to see the film. All they have to do is help you build a narrative in your head, help you see yourself through that story. If they give you the PowerPoint, then A, it's boring, and B, you know the film anyway, so what's the point? So we've got to give you enough to get you interested, enough to get you engaged, enough to start to build it for yourself. Because it's only when you start building your own narrative that you can get engaged through purpose. So how do we do that? Well, they're all done in exactly the same way. They start with a simple question, which is, who are we? Uh, and again, look at that. I mean, I've got you on there. I've got... You, if they're, they're new, I don't know, well, maybe not you anymore, uh, depending on where you're from. I've even got David. I don't know if David is on the call, but if he listens, it's 3 in the morning in New Zealand. But he tweeted that he was going to log on to the, to the webinar. So I just wanted to make sure that he was captured in there, because if you log on at 3 in the morning, you've got to be made feel special. Um, or all the rest of you, because I don't know where you're all from. But in any case, that's where you start. Who are we? And by that, I mean... What is our value together? What makes us a unit? What makes me uh, who I am? What am I going to share with you? What is it that we're trying to do? Because once we know who we are, then we can go to where are we going. 
Uh, so what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to do in order to answer the last question, which is why are we going there? So if you think who are we, where are we going, why are we going there, enables you to build your tagline so that you can at least start to engage people in the work that you do. Now, I'm not a movie director, I'm not a Hollywood executive, I'm not a marketing person, but I guess the best advice I can give you is find a marketeer, find somebody who can help you start to think through this purpose, this tagline of the work you do. And you can't rely on the big stuff. So it is not all you know, world-changing, world-beating, life-changing. You have to rely on the reality. So yes, of course, if you are in healthcare, you all have patients patient care as your purpose. It's taken as read, but it's not enough. It's not enough because it's the same as everybody. So, you know, if I'm a surgeon and I'm doing my job, of course I have patient care, but for you to come to me and say, oh, by the way, we'd like to work with you on improvement because it's for patient care, then all you're doing is you're reminding me how my patient care is more important than your patient care. So it's not that helpful. So what you have to do is you always have to rebuild that purpose as you go. Uh, through every interaction with every different group, rethinking about what's my panda here? What, I, what can I put on the table that is going to make them want to align the energy? And again, you know, as I was reading some of the, the, the material that some of you have put out, um, you know, you do it. I mean, it is possible to do without the weird panda stuff. You know, here I, I can see some people were writing about the three questions they asked, which is, is there really a clinical need? What are the alternative? Have we tried everything? Uh, patients are and feel safe, staff and feel safe, are and feel safe. I mean, these are great kind of narratives in which I can start to see myself. So it's not, again, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be weird, but I think it's a step that you consciously have to take to think through, you know, what's the purpose in what we're trying to do together. Because once you've got the purpose, then you suddenly reconnect it to the formal objective. And then your role becomes your ability to maintain those connections, which is step three uh, on that slide, and maintain the alignment between the formal and uh, the informal organization. And the way you maintain it is through dialogue. And, and dialogue, unfortunately, is something that we uh, tend to do less and less of. Uh, in many organizations because of the pressure uh, that um, we are being put under, um, be they financial or pressures of time. Uh, I, and I always have, I mean, I always go around with this picture in my head when I see leaders in organizations because they all remind me of Elvis because they're all singing the same song. And the song, you know it. It's a little, a little less conversation, a little more action, please. And many leaders... Uh, are always saying this. They're saying, look, you know, can we stop this conversation? Can we just get on with it? And we're so busy. And, and what we forget if we go down the Elvis road is that actually the only reason an action takes place is because a conversation has happened. Actually, we act on the basis of the amount of conversation. The reason why we tend to do the things we do is because somebody didn't just ask but seemed to be working on it all the time. Uh, you know, it's a bit like when people say what gets measured gets done. Well, the only reason what gets measured gets done is because most leaders only talk about what gets measured, uh, and because they only talk about it, we kind of deem it important enough to do something about it. And so it is the power of those conversations uh, that are going to help us uh, move along, and, and, and conversations really uh, slightly different uh, than the ones that we tend to default to, which tend to be corrective, but what, how do we have generative conversations? And you have to start with, I mean, this is Dr. House, uh, and, and again, I'm reminded in your world, uh, we have to start with an appreciation of not just what's broken, but actually this idea of uh, you know, the ground rounds that medics do and the idea of how do we learn from each other by starting to look at actually what does it look like when it's working well. So I know that, you know, if you've got the improvement badge on, people are going to start looking at you thinking, well, okay, you, you, you fix what's broken. But start from what's working well. So when everything is working, when we are at our best, when we achieve incredible results and incredible outcomes, then actually why was that? What was going on there? Um, what can we learn from this in terms of discovering all the things that 
were present, all the condition and who was involved. And then we can start dreaming. Then we can start thinking about, you know, have we discovered that? Then how do we uh, replicate that? How do we dream? What would it be like if it was always like this? Um, and then we start to get a lot more granular and a lot more detail, which then enables us to design the system, uh, which hopefully will replicate it. But by going through those stages of conversations, what we ensure is that then people are master of their own destiny. It is only when people have been through the generative conversation that they hold on the outcome and then carry on doing the work. Now, for those of you uh, in HR or interested, this is a process which is uh, called appreciative inquiry. Um, colleague um, David Cooperider wrote uh, some books on it, and, and it was used as part of the UN Compact. But it's a process that I would encourage you to think through when you have conversation with people, because then it ha helps you to have generative dialogues. And again, you know, I'm, I, I know there are some dialogues going on in healthcare all of the time, um, and I know that they enable you to learn and develop as you go. But I think it's when you start putting this trust, this purpose, and this dialogue then actually you can start to merge the systems again uh, so that you have a chance to go far and fast together. Um, I know I've been speaking quite a long time, so I, 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 before we jump on and, and hopefully answer questions and have a bit of back and forth, I just wanted to leave you with a thought, which is a number, um, and I do this everywhere I go, so I, I I thought I wouldn't skip it this time. The number is 14,600, and, and it may be a big number or a small number. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I can make it very small uh, because 14,600 is roughly uh, the number of days you have left uh, to live. So, so that's a cheerful uh, note to end on. But, um, the, uh, and, and I don't know if I've been generous or not because I, I don't know your age, so I've just taken a kind of average. Um, but the reason I wanted to leave you with that is back in 2003, uh, yeah, I know it sounds a bit like a game show, but, but in the U.S. there was a small study done where over 1,000 people were asked, um, at the age, they were over the age of 65, and they were told, look, if you could have your time again, what are the three things you would do differently? And what was fascinating to us is that actually most of the answers were exactly the same, and we could group them under three headings. So I'm going to share those with you. People said I would take time to stop and ask the big questions. I would be more courageous and I would take more risk in work and love, and I would try to live with purpose, make a difference. Now, the difference between those people and you is I've just told you what you're likely to regret, so uh, I guess my closing question is why wait? Uh, why wait to do those things? You already have, uh, for many of you, purpose built into what you do. Um, it's uh, uh, downside more excited at dinner parties to say, uh, I help save lives rather than say I'm a management consultant, I'm sure. Um, so the purpose in what you do is there, um, and many of us are privileged enough uh, to be able to ask a question. And, uh, you know, the only uh, difference, I guess, and, and I don't think we can play the media, uh, but the only difference tomorrow uh, is that whilst the earth will still turn, uh, there will just be one day less. So the number tomorrow is 14599. And on that cheerful note, um, I'm just uh, showing you this um, as a way to say, um, please do connect. I know we're going to have a chat, but um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for listening to me. And you can find me just about everywhere on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. So if you don't get a chance to ask a question uh, and you want to follow it up, uh, please do. Uh, I'll always be happy to answer. I will make a promise to you. Uh, I will never try to charge you anything or to sell you anything. Uh, I don't have time to deliver anything. So um, it's not a sales ploy. It's just saying, please, um, get in touch. But on that note, thank you so much for listening. I know it's, um, it's sometimes hard. Okay. Emmanuel, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, nobody will be able to see this, but I had one job, which was to follow your script and think of questions and so on, and you, you made it very hard because that was a distractingly fascinating talk, and I think I'm sure lots of people felt the same. So thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, I'm sure we do have a lot of questions. Quite a few have been coming up in the chat box, but Andrew, do you want to, to kick us off, please? Andrew Winter. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? I yeah, can. Yeah, you fine. So, 
there's lots of questions running, but thinking through Emmanuel's stuff, um, we have a particular issue in healthcare, uh, particularly in this country, uh, in the UK, with a socialised model of care. Um, and the problems of this, we have increasing attempts to control and micromanage senior professionals. We've got a political process that's really obsessed with operational measures and getting results, and some of that was picked up in the chat box already. We've got in healthcare pretty much unlimited demand and expectations. And right across public sector work, teaching, police, health, we seem to have a, a crisis of leadership, very difficult to find people willing to step into the breach, willing to be a chief executives, willing to take on leadership roles. Um, so I'm interested in Emmanuel's work right across Europe. Where have you seen good leadership and what are the specific skills and behaviors that you think people should exhibit? You've mentioned a few, such as being good at dialoguing, and you've talked in your writings about discretionary effort, which I thought was an interesting phrase. But what are the key things we can do to use the remaining 10,000 days we have to the best? <laughs> um, I, you know, it's interesting, because I find this question uh, as awkward as the other question people normally ask me, which is, who do you think is a great leader? Give me a name. You know? and, and, and the reason I find it awkward is actually I can't tell you um, I, I can't say, oh, well, you know, the health, the health sector, the health system in, in no way is particularly great or whatever, um, because actually it's really hard at an overall system level to identify those things. What I can tell you, though, is I know amazing leaders in all across Europe, which nobody has ever heard of because they're about two or three levels down in the organization and are making their team function incredibly well. And so I think... You know, the, the, the words of comfort, uh, I guess, that I can offer is that leadership is possible at every level. I have never seen, uh, I, I don't buy the, you know, it only gets the, if the top person says it or, you know, I, I mean, everybody who is trying to do change in organization will say, oh, we, we, need, we need executive sponsorship. You don't actually. Um, what you need is leadership credibility and leadership maturity. Uh, wherever you operate and at any level you operate. So let, let, let me try to address the characteristics uh, for a second. Uh, I did a piece of work um, a few years back on what is it that followers look for? Because I'm tired of, of you know, the whole development idea of leadership being about let's copy what great leaders do, because then you become a poor copy of somebody else. So let's try to think rather than about other leaders, let's try to think about what followers look for. And, and it's really straightforward. They look for three things. Um, does that person get me? Uh, do, do they get me? Do they live on the same planet as I do? That's why we're so obsessed to ask our politicians if they know the price of bread or the price of milk, because we're always trying to look for markers of do they get me. And that, in my world, is called compassion. You know, do they understand what I'm going through? Do they understand what it feels like to be me? And are they driven to make it better for me? And I think you can, you know, you can do that uh, in the world of work. Now, once you've got compassion, then you can start giving hope, which is to me one of the second indicators of, you know, do, do these people get me, do they share my values? So compassion and hope, I think, are pretty critical uh, to being able to release that discretionary effort, to being able to get people on board to want to follow you. Now, once you've done that, then obviously you're going to need some proof point that you can deliver. So the first question is, do they get me? Uh, and and you know, are they my kind of people or whatever, however you want to articulate it? And the second question is, if push comes to shove, do they have the character to deliver it? So actually, are they just trying to, you know, say the right things or do they genuinely believe that? And then there's a certain element that comes into play here, which is about integrity. Uh, and by the way, I'm French, so, so I don't mean that integrity in a moral sense. I would, I would find that hard to do. But, but I, um, by integrity, I just mean are their thoughts aligned with their uh, words and aligned with their actions. And, and if we can get that, that sense of alignment between what you say you want and what, what, what you do, then I think, again, you're increasing chances of people following you. And then there is a, 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 a last thing that, um, that we want is, is people saying, well, actually, that's all well and good, but can they deliver? And in order to deliver, then you have to put some measurements in place, which is why I like appreciative inquiry, because what I mean by measurements is can we give people marker of what the future might look like so they know when we're making progress towards it. So 
you know, it's a long answer to, to a good question, but I think you know, the answer is the hope of making it work can only be found locally. I mean, I think there's, um, the, you know, there's no, uh, I mean, I, dread, I hate to use um, President Obama's word, but, but in many ways, you, you know, you're the change you're looking for or, or, or you're the change you want to see. We can only make it happen locally given all the tidal wave of change that is happening on a national or a global level. And that we can do when, as individuals, we decide to become leaders, whether we're given the title or not, um, by trying to muster um, the energy of our followers and, and the people that we want to follow us. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you very much. That was a fascinating question, a fascinating answer. Um, the questions are flying in thick and fast, and unfortunately, I'm not sure we're going to have time to do all of them, but rather than me rabbiting on, I'm going to go to a very interesting one that uh, Akintoya uh, Akinoya, the speciality doctor from uh, the Golden Jubilee, welcome this afternoon, has asked us about what happens when networks are not empowered nor aligned. I mean, we have some experience of that, but um, the point that's made is that some of the best ideas seem to come from what you might call the front line, but um, uh, how much of this empowered, respectful conversations can have practical benefits in terms of flushing those ideas up from the front line to, to, to take hold in the organization. We, we all probably can see this in an NHS context, Emmanuel, but do you have a, any reflections on that in terms of other organizations you work with, and in particular how they might have done something positive to improve that dialogue? I, you know, it, it, it's, um, uh, again, another fascinating question um, to which there isn't a, a silver bullet, but it, it's, um, it, it's an interesting question because I mean I, I don't know if you if you remember but um, but Google for a while we're talking about 20% time or 15% time depending on who you were talking to and saying you know we, we give time to our to our people to explore the things that they want to do on their own and 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 that was never quite true to be fair it, it was more like 120% time so you can have 20% on top if you do what you're mandated to do but but there is always this question of you know how, how do you make some of those conversations. Uh, flow back up? How do you make some of those things practical? Um, and I guess, you know, it, it, th th that's the only bit at which you need some um, cover from, from uh, other executives who are, are um, likely to listen uh, and likely to want to work with you. Because I think it, it is, you know, it is really difficult for things to filter back up. Now, there's a lot of stuff which can be done locally, and there's a lot of things which you can do in your unit, and there's, there's, a, uh, there's also a lot of stuff that can waste a lot of time. So, you know, this is why I always insist on the picture being that actually both the formal and the informal organizations matter, um, because you don't want uh, to run a social experiment. You know, if I go into a, a hospital uh, to have an operation, I don't want to be told, oh, hang on, the, the, the nurses and the doctors are not, not around right now because they're having a meeting, and and, but they'll see you whenever they fancy. Um, so you, you want both systems in place, uh, and you have to be careful that, you, you know, your networks don't paralyze you um, in some way. But the, the, the trick, I guess, of making sure that it fills the filters back up is coming back to that point on purpose, is changing the purpose. So, so one of the things that has worried me a lot recently in the private sector, and not so much in the public sector, but in the private sector, one of the big issues that everybody's talking about purpose, you know, they've all read the, read the book about why and we need to have a why, and they stick to one, and they say, you know, we need one purpose. And, and I guess my point about the panda is you have to be able to change, to, to kind of in a way, put the exact same film with a different node to ensure that you, you're targeting a different population. So if something is happening locally because of the purpose that you've managed to engineer, it doesn't mean that that purpose is going to resonate beyond, beyond your, um, your unit. So how do you then take that and understand the concern? And then I'm back into uh, the, the, the answer I gave to the last question, which is it's kind of back to the compassion thing about Okay, so now you can walk in the shoes of your team. Can you walk in the shoes of your boss? And do you understand their world? And how are you going to make stuff resonate in their world? How are you going to appeal to their world? And that means changing your purpose as you go. Um, so as I say, it doesn't sound very practical. and I know it's not a silver bullet, but it's, there's a huge amount of thinking um, about how do we ensure that those systems talk. But again, what I haven't found, um, and, and, you know, um, 
yeah, I've looked, but what I haven't found is, is an overall system, a huge organization where I can say, oh, yeah, no, no, dialogue flows everywhere. And, um, you know, we read a lot of great case studies in the Harvard Business Reviews and other ones, and, and most of that stuff, you know, I'm not sure is, is actually happening in reality. I, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done to, um, to change those purposes as we go and manage to engage tactically at different level with different people. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, there's loads of interesting questions, and one of the things that's encouraging me is people, people on the chat line are often answering, answering each other's questions a bit. So um, we have questions well, this is why, this is why I didn't want to speak at all now. today. I, I wanted you guys to speak to me for half an hour, because I'm, I know, I'm, I know. I'm We're running seeing some time, of those notes, and I'm Emmanuel, thinking, I wish I'd thought of that. Emmanuel, in about one minute, this is, this is the thing TV interviews do. I'll ask you a very easy one, which is uh, derived from a prompt. Um, where where's it gone from? Uh, from um, Karen Ritchie, uh, which I'm going to paraphrase as, how do we walk in the shoes of the politicians? Because it feels like often the political imperative is everything fixed now, tomorrow, with no resource and no bad news and so on. Have you any experience of operating in that role, or is, or is, is that an even more <laughs> imponderable um, question than the ones we've given you so far? Well, I'm reminded of the words of my friend Tom Peters, who, who said, um, the, the smellier the shoes, the harder it is to walk in them. Um, and, and I guess that's, uh, that's true in that case. I, I mean, I, you know, the, the good news, and, and, and please don't, don't quote me or, or record that one bit, but the good news is, is it's, it's very easy to walk in the shoes of a caricature because we can all uh, be that caricature. So I think you have to, and, and, you know, the serious point with that is you have to play devil's advocate. Um, and, and, and you have to work through that, and you have to understand that it is a reality. Um, and, and, you know, you can't drag people to your way of thinking. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been going through a lot of discussions recently, what with me being French and living in, in, in England and, and Brexit and all of that, and a lot of people said, well, you know, obviously it's easy to say, look, everybody who voted that way is stupid, misguided, racist, whatever, whatever, whatever. But actually, that doesn't advance the agenda. The only way you can do that is by actually understanding, you know, what is at the root of that person's concern. And, and, and you know, it, it's, um, it's a fascinating thing to go through to think, well, actually, how, how do I – you know, it's a bit uh, – and, and I'll just close with that again. It's a bit of the difference between the Nuremberg – trials and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, and there's been some beautiful writing done about actually how do you create that compassion for people who are so different from you? Um, and it is not easy, uh, and, and it is hard, but it comes back to that kind of dialogue, and, and, and you will understand you know, some of those pressure, and, and, and a lot of the time you have to think the exact opposite to what you think, but it's only by going there uh, that you'll be able to get that person to think along the same lines as you. Um, and it's always by going there that you also reassure that person that actually your aim is not that different, but you just need to work together differently. Emmanuel, thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer to, to a, a, an unfairly difficult question right at the end. And please, please don't jump off the line, because although we need to shut it down, we'd like to just uh, say a few words to you afterwards. So thank you so much, Emmanuel. Well, that was quite a session, and um, I'm going to have to watch it again about three times to pick up all the information in there. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and we have many other um, fantastic sessions for you throughout the year. Um, I don't know how we'd top that one, but uh, Steve Swenson must be getting worried because uh, we got him booked for May, and he um, is coming to speak to us from his position in the, um, the Mayo Clinic, where he's Medical Director for Leadership and Organizational Development, as well as a professor at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and he's worked with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and will be uh, very well known to many. Um, so please do keep following us on Twitter. There's loads of questions there, and I'm sorry we didn't have more time for discussion, but it was such an interesting talk. Um, please follow us on Twitter. Please stay in touch. Please stay connected to each other. Please encourage people to watch this session if they missed it. I would specifically say if you have organizational development colleagues or HR colleagues who may not have dialed into this, I would strongly advise you to tap them on the shoulder and say, have a look at this session on his website, because I think it'll provoke a lot of useful thinking there. I'm certainly going to do that. I'll just close off this public um, part of this by saying thank you very much indeed, Emmanuel. You more than lived up to our 
expectations. Thank you very much for those who came on the call and who contributed to it and asked such uh, um, amazing questions. And I'm very sorry we couldn't ask them all. Thank you for helping each other and asking your questions. And of course, thank you to, um, from me to the team here at HIS and Brian, who's not here, um, for making this fantastic series possible. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, good evening and um, over and out from us. Good night.